Welcome to COVID and the Creative Process. Today's event is hosted by Bellevue Literary Review and is an official part of the Brooklyn Book Festival. I'm Danielle Ofri, Editor-in-Chief of BLR, and my co-host today is Doris W. Cheng, Assistant Fiction Editor of BLR. We're joined today by poet Philip B. Williams and novelist Wifey Wang. We'll also have special appearances by essayist Joseph Osmondson and playwright Sarah Rule, who is also a poet. Bellevue Literary Review is an award-winning journal, this is BLR, um, devoted to creative writings about health, illness, and healing. Having just turned 20, BLR is now a full-fledged literary arts organization and nonprofit that not only publishes its flagship journal, but also hosts a full calendar of events and creative collaborations at the nexus of healthcare and the arts. Please check us out at www.blreview.org. Thanks, Danielle. It's been almost three years since COVID-19 upended our lives. Healthcare workers were thrown into an unknown pandemic that consumed every waking hour. Writers and artists suddenly faced different pressures, some gaining the gift of writing time, while others found creative work impossible in the face of illness, loss, childcare needs, and financial and political upheaval. The impact on writers' lives has been varied and frequently profound. We are here to discuss how the pandemic has, has affected writers' relationships to their work, their material, and their creative process. It's a real pleasure to introduce our guests who will be joining us for this conversation. Poet Philip B. Williams is the author of Mutiny from Penguin Random House 2021, Thief in the Interior, Alice James Books 2016, and the chapbooks Bruised Gospels, Arts in Bloom 2011, and Burn, Yes, Yes Books 2013. Williams's work appears in Boston Review, Callaloo, Kenyon Review, The New Republic, The New Yorker, and others. He is the recipient of a 2020 Creative Writing Grant from the National Endowment of the Arts, a 2017 Whiting Award, and a 2013 Ruth Lilly Fellowship. He is a winner of the 2017 Kate Tufts Discovery Award and a 2017 Lambda Literary Award. Williams serves as a faculty member at Bennington College and Randolph College, Low Res MFA. Novelist Waiki Wang is the author of Chemistry from Knopf in 2017 and Joan is Okay, Random House 2022. She is the recipient of a 2018 Penn Hemingway Award, a Whiting Award, and is a National Book Foundation 5 Under 35 honoree. Her work has appeared in Plowshares and The New Yorker, among other publications. She appears in the 2019 Best American Short Stories and O. Henry Prize anthologies. She earned her MFA from Boston University and her other degrees from Harvard. She currently lives in New York City and teaches at the University of Pennsylvania, Columbia University, and Barnard College. Welcome, Philip and Waikie. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Doris. Um, I'd like to start off by just seeing what were your lives like pre-COVID? Uh, Philip, why don't you go first? What were you doing before the pandemic? Pre-COVID, I was still teaching at Bennington. I started that job at the uh, fall session 2016, and I was getting adjusted in and becoming full-time because I was a visitor for my first years there, and then I was hired as full-time faculty in, uh, I believe, 2019. Um, and so I just that was one of my first years, I think it was my, sec my, my second year of being full-time. And then um, I was also working on a uh, long fiction project. I was working on a novel relatively peacefully. And, you know, just li living my life on the schedule. I had to travel between New York and Vermont to get to work and come back home. I would do that once a week. And so there was a lot of traveling involved in my life at that time, too. Great. And how about you, Waiki? What were you doing? Pre-pandemic. Um, I had just actually turned into turned in a draft of Jonah's Okay. Who, Jonah's an ICU doctor, and I had turned it in without any COVID or pandemic in there. Um, and then I actually turned it in March 1st and then March 15th, I think my editor got COVID or something. Um, and it was sort of a, a realization of having to think about the novel in a new sphere, think about a novel with like kind of new legs. Um, everything was going online. So I had maybe like 50 very unhappy kids going online and like moving out of their dorms. Um, and very angry about the whole process because a lot of them had to move in with their parents again um, and sort of teaching online 
pretty much until like the year after, you know, because it was sort of like everything shut down and everything went online. It was just so drastic. Um, and I you could really see it, like no graduations, nothing. It was kind of a wild semester. <laughs> sure, how about you, Doris? What were you doing pre-pandemic? Um, being way too busy with things that, that were really not important in retrospect. <laughs> And having come through it, I think um, I'll never go back because uh, it was really liberating to just be unfettered from all of the trappings of daily life. Yeah. Um, and I think for me, it, it, it was a little bit, I mean, it's a terrible thing to say that the pandemic was a gift, but the solitude was a gift, I think, um, in some ways. So. Did you get a lot of writing done? Yeah. <laughs> 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 which uh yes which was which was really great um yeah it's so interesting why why gee it sounds like um and, and i guess this, this is a question that, that uh that uh i wanted to get to later but it sounds like the pandemic really kind of fit um it, it wasn't something you planned in your novel but it kind of fit in the um in the workings of the plot yeah um, and um yeah i just i wondered if you could like did you struggle against um, including it because it wasn't what you'd envisioned, or what did you? Yeah. Um, because it's it it does work really well, I think. Um, right. I mean, I think so. I mean, at this point, I can't go back and redo it. <laughs> but we were we were sort of under this deadline after deadline, getting pushed back and thinking about how to incorporate it. The pandemic and COVID does come in in the second half. I just remember this distinct conversation I had with my editor and she just said, you know, hate to be blunt, but you are writing a Chinese American New York doctor who works in the ICU while everyone is going to know COVID when this book comes out. Like, how do you feel about that? You know, are you not going to talk about it? Are you going to talk about it? And sometimes that is kind of the burden of what representation or burden of kind of like bringing something in because it almost seemed like there was so much intersectionality. I had chosen this occupation for this person. Um, and uh, COVID was at that point, you know, there was a lot of kind of misinformation about where it came from and what caused it, um, giving rise to a lot of sort of discrimination that came after. Um, so there was this thought of like, I, I think I had to address it otherwise, um, I would feel worse not having addressed it. And there's sort of this responsibility that, you know, I had to do it. If I wasn't going to do it, I I don't know, you know, James Patterson was going to do it. You know, like, I don't know who was going to do it <laughs> for this character. Um, saying, um, Philip, how, how did the pandemic affect your creative process and your work? Uh, I had the hardest time transitioning because we had two weeks to go from in person to Zoom, yes. and no one knew what to do with Zoom. I didn't even know that there was a whiteboard option on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> I had no, it was rough. My students were miserable. I I was miserable. So one one thing that happened, um, which ended up being beneficial, but I had to learn the the hard way, was realizing that I. I needed a diagnosis for my neurodivergence badly. <laughs> um, and I ended up thinking that I would have, you know, like one thing to to deal with and it was multiple. <laughs> I was like, yeah. okay, so this yeah. is, this is, but it, everything that um, I was experiencing pre-COVID, I was able to, in many ways, hide behind being busy, hide behind uh, different gigs. And then when COVID in its own particular way froze, a lot of the those opportunities or jobs, I had to sit with myself in a way that um, I had always wanted to. But on top of that, other work compiled in a way that I was not used to. So with the isolation and not being able to have you know friends or or family nearby, and the fact that I like to get out of the the house that helped, I had to really sit with myself and think, oh, so this is what I've been living with all this time. And so it helped me to uh, reevaluate my mental health in a way. Right. I was curious, you talked about you were working on a novel and um, I was curious, did, did did the pandemic kind of change the direction of, of your work in terms of what you became 
um, what became uh, what came to the forefront of, of what you were working on? Um, because not at all. Uh huh. No, because I finished Mutiny during um, twenty twenty one as well. I finished that that last draft there uh, during twenty twenty. Excuse me, the the last draft of that. And there's, if anything, it was it was I I wanted to keep COVID out of everything that I was creating. Um, and the novel takes place per, uh, in a in a long in a long time ago, like in the eighteen hundreds, and so there was no space for there to be any kind of direct conversation about COVID in the book. There is a scene that deals with uh, a sickness that that moves through a town, but it's a brief. And I think I had written that before COVID happened. And so the writing process, it's, I, it still happened because that was one of the main anchors I had to reality. In a strange way, fiction helped connect me uh, to to the, the, the life that um, was in many ways slipping away or, or evolving because of COVID, but it didn't really enter my work in any capacity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'd actually like to bring in Joseph Osmondson right now. Um, mm -hmm. Joe Osmondson is a biologist at NYU whose previous book, Capsid, a love song, won the uh, Paz Award for Best HIV Writing and was a finalist for a Lambda Literary Award. His new book, Virology, Essays for the Living, the Dead, and the Small Things in Between, was just published, and Joe will read a short excerpt for us. Joe, thanks for being here. Thank you so Before much you read your me. excerpt, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how COVID has affected your writing and your creative process. Oh my goodness. Well, you know, I'm trained as, as a microbiologist um, and have deep roots in the queer community and our responses to viruses all the way. You know, I was born in 1983 um, within a year of the time that HIV was um, recognized, the HIV virus was recognized as the cause of AIDS. Um, so to me, uh, understanding viruses both biologically uh, but also their impact on our daily lives has been a life project um, and a big, a major thrust of my, of my writing. And, you know, so COVID is both the subject of my work. It was the subject of a lot of advocacy and activism we were doing in 2020 to try to get the best healthcare and treatment to people, get the information to people in the clearest way we could. But then just like everyone else, of course, COVID completely upended the routines of my daily life. And um, I found myself at home and I found myself anxious and scared uh, like we all were. Um, the, you know, April 2020 uh, in New York City, I, I didn't leave. I couldn't get out. I had no place to go and you couldn't leave home and there were sirens all the time. And so the, the page became a place where I could write just for myself um, to, to, I mean, honestly, just to make it, <laughs> just, to, just to make it through the days and to feed myself spiritually um, to nurture myself, to care for myself in ways that would allow me to keep doing the work I needed to for myself and my family and, and the community. Well, I mean, that sounds like a great intro to the piece that you'll you'll read. So would you like to read it? Sure, I would love to. Yeah, this um, this comes from some journal entries I was writing at I exactly that time uh, that ended up making its way into my book. And I will also say that the the entirety of the journal that I wrote at that time, completely unedited, just a few names um, blanked out, is available on, on the archive section of the book's website where you can see some of the other source materials I was using. So this is from September 8th, 2020. My alarm goes off today, and today I have somewhere to be, not just somewhere metaphorically, I have a meeting. And not just a Zoom meeting, this meeting is on campus the first since March, six months ago. I'm not just biking to work to sit alone in my office. I'm biking to work to prepare my webcam for teaching from my lab tomorrow. I'm biking in to meet face to face with the other TAs from the other lab I teach to show them the lab equipment that we'll be using and to get their webcam set up for them too. This world has been set up for me. I had little choice in it. This class is in person and I'm one of the managers of the TAs and the TAs need to be trained. And so here we find ourselves, four bodies and four hearts and eight lungs and four mouths, all dangerous to one another. We sit six feet apart and we sit in masks. I show the TAs which buttons on the GoPro actually make it go. 
Natasha is one of my TAs, and we had worked together in a lab for two years before I took this new job teaching. How is Gabby doing, I ask. And she shows me a picture of her child on her phone, holding out her hand so our bodies can stay far apart. But I'm surprised. It feels good to be with people. It feels good to be meeting face to face. I'm cognizant always of how many feet there are between me and the other people in the room. And I imagine the room filling up with air slowly, filling up with our exhaled breath, a potentially dangerous thing. I haven't been inside this long with anyone but Devin and Andre and Gofen, and that came after negotiating a testing schedule and talking about what risks we'd take outside our little group. We promised to check in with each other, even before dumb hookups. Back at work, I calculate the volume of air in the room and the number of minutes we've shared that air, but who cares? It feels good to talk to people without a screen between us. What I'm scared of is what feels good. Plagues place our bodies at odds with our minds. An hour later, I'm in a Zoom room with my therapist, Dr. Eric. Big shout out, Dr. Eric. I'm in my office and he's in his home and we see each other on screens. When do you feel completely safe? He asked me. When I'm at home, lying on the bed with Devin, I say, at that moment, I feel completely safe. What about now, he asks, in your office alone? Do you feel completely safe? Well, no, I say, because I had to come here, ride an elevator, meet with TAs. But right now, right now, in this moment, how do you feel? What are your risks right now? None. I admit, just be mindful of these moments and let yourself really feel them, he says. I try to scoff, but I find tears in my eyes. I tell him that even moments of pure joy and clarity have felt risky, even if that risk seems invented. When I cook, as I run my knife through onions and garlic or fish or chicken, I often picture the knife cutting through the animal layers of my own flesh. Nothing feels safe, not even a home-cooked meal. These bloody imaginings started in April. If I cut myself cooking then, I could have gotten COVID at the hospital, but I also couldn't not cook. Most restaurants were closed even for takeout. For once, that blood was not my plague worry. My plague worry was the air I'd breathe as my flesh got sewed up. So it's nighttime now, and I'm home again with Devin, and I'm writing. What are your risks right now, Dr. Eric asked me. None, I say to myself, none. I'm just in my home, and I'm writing. Maybe I see now this is why I'm writing so much. When it's just me and an empty page, I can conjure a virus without being susceptible to it. The virus becomes a thing out there and my in here becomes safe. Praise be to writing, something I can do alone, but something I can do alone with the world, amen. Blessed be this writing. I don't know who it will save, but it's already saved me. Sing to high heaven of this writing. It's here that I feel completely safe. Consider all the worlds thy hands have made. This page is the world I can control. Oh, my soul, praise the banal joy of a meeting of human bodies and let us leave it unscathed, amen. Four mouths, eight lungs, keep us all safe, our mouths, our lungs, our hearts, oh, here. Oh, words, let my lungs fill up with air. Let you words be expelled and breathed in through this dangerous air. And let us all wake tomorrow alive, but more than alive, alive, breathing deep, alive and well, and completely safe.
Thank you, Jill. That was really beautiful. And your piece captures so perfectly that moment in time when we all felt so much anxiety and so much uncertainty and every joy was undercut by fear. Um, even the banal ones, as you, as you mentioned. I love the reverential way that you, you um, talk about writing and the benediction of saying, blessed be this writing. I don't know who it will save, but it's already saved me. I wanted to ask if you still had the same relationship to writing. Is it still a place where you feel safe and in control or does it have a different purpose now that we're almost three years into the pandemic? It, I think it always will in a way. Um, some writers hate writing, but love having written. I'm a writer that loves writing. I love the excitement and possibility of an empty page. Um, and this book was sold not to be a timely book. I mean, when, when we were pitching out a book about viruses, their political and social and cultural meaning, in addition to their biological meaning, it was very important to the press that like if COVID went away, which at that time was not necessarily likely, but it was certainly a possibility that the book would still have an important message. And, you know, here I sit um, and at this very moment, one of my very best friends has monkey pox and another, we just had to advocate to get them um, a post-exposure um, vaccine. Uh, and uh, the world feels just as heavy um, and the blank phage feels just as urgent as it did in 2020. And on our planet that continues to warm with biological and non-biological threats coming at us seemingly endlessly, I, I, I imagine that won't change. I'm so sorry to hear about your friend. I know you mentioned you were a part of the, um, the COVID-19 working group, the mm -hmm. advocacy group of, of healthcare workers and scientists who are trying to address the systemic response to the virus. And I know that you've been outspoken about the government's response um, to the spread of the monkeypox virus. Can you talk about the connection between your writing and your activism? The, the writing, I guess, is an extension of it. I, I, sort of was, I, I sort of was challenged and pushed in the early COVID crisis when I was doing much activism um, and it, it, I felt depleted. I felt like I was, I felt like that's where my time could be best spent in terms of um, helping a more equitable response to what, you know, was then and remains a, a deadly virus. And it was Alexander Chi, my friend, who actually said, your writing is a part of this, um, you know, the way that, <laughs> I'm just gonna, the way faggots think about risk and viruses is nuanced and essential and writing down that nuance take on no activity being perfectly safe, but the less risk we take, the better we care for ourselves and other others um, that he told me to do that. And once I started, um, I couldn't stop. And, you know, my, on, the, uh, on monkey pox, largely we've been doing direct advocacy at every level. And I can't like two people today, not good friends, but in my social network DM would me saying, I just tested positive and how do I get the drug? And there's issues with every level of, of response. So, you know, writing is one way that I imagine caring for people and m myself and other people and um, advocacy is, is another, another lane of that same highway, I guess. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Joe Osmondson brings up the issue of feeling safe. And he says, um, consider all the worlds thy hands have made. This page is the world I can control. And I wanted to ask the both of you if you felt similarly. Does writing create a space of safety and control in a world that can feel unsafe? Mm -hmm. Or can being on the edge sometimes push you into new territory? Um, Waiki, do you want to um, respond first? Um, writing is a lot it, it's like open water right you have to make choices and at the beginning you're sort of overwhelmed with the choices that you have um but if you don't make any choices then the reader is not going to know where you're going um and so there is that sense of control there there's play there's experimentation um like today every day i mean today i was working on sort of, uh the third half of book three, um, and the scene didn't end how I thought it was gonna end, you know, many months ago when I planned it. And I had no idea how it was gonna end until like two hours ago when 
sitting there looking at my water boil and I thought maybe I should try something like this and then I go back and try it and it, it works to me today and then I'll check it again tomorrow. So I think it's just a very kind of tactile and trial and error process. I actually think I don't have that much control over the story once I, I make a few choices at the beginning. There's only so many routes that um, it can go afterwards. Um, and so in that way, I feel like the story sort of takes me with it. Um, and I'm just kind of trying to write it and trying to, you know, like pull it out of the page, like pull it out of the marble or whatever, right? Um, but you do have to kind of have this vision at the, at the beginning of what you want it to sort of look like. And then the piece takes shape on its own through, you know, places yeah. that you end up going every day. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Similar, I think similar to like you, what you were saying, uh, I had an outline <laughs> and and by chapter, I realized that I was off the outline when mm -hmm. I was supposed to be in one chapter, and I was I think several chapters behind. Yep. <laughs> and but several chapters ahead in what I had written, so I was on chapter nine, but in chapter five of the outline, so I just scrapped all of that. It didn't matter <laughs> because it had its own trajectory, it had its own where where it wanted to go. So yeah, definitely, I believe in that organic process, and it was it was beneficial to just let the story, following the vision, right? You mentioned right. vision, following the vision, allowing that to be um, the leader, and I and I think being able to surrender to that process was part of something that made COVID a little bit more uh, possible to get through because I always had that um, meditative kind of quality to the way that I write and, and can just give myself over to be a poem or, or part of the novel, just give myself over to the process. So that, that, that was helpful, honestly, to be able to write through so many of those days where I was um, not, not in my best self. Right, right, and just being very forgiving of, if it doesn't work out today, I can still try again tomorrow. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, and it's a problem that's really hard to explain to someone who doesn't write. You, I don't even bother, you know, it's like, what do you mean you just figure it out? I mean, you just figure it out. You sit there and you try to figure it out. Um, it's funny that you mentioned just figure it out because I wanted to ask you, uh, Waiki, you you um, have a doctor as a protagonist in your novel, and, and that's my day job. I'm a doctor at Bellevue. And so, of course, when the pandemic came, that's what we did. We just had it figured out. And so I spent most of the spring of 2020 with my colleagues kind of on the fly. And you couldn't explain to anyone outside the field what we were doing every day was just kind of reinventing, uh, you know, new wheels and, and all sorts of things. How did you get into this character's head because you're you're not a doctor um yeah how did you do that um i was pretty mad for a really long time i think i worked for two like two cardiologists over two years i think i have hundreds of hours of shadowing so i really did draw on that um and i still work heavily with the mcat curriculum so it, it was actually pretty straightforward for me um, and at this point, most of my friends have graduated to become attending. So I pretty much just ask them about their days and then I take note of what they say and then I kind of meld it together. So in that case, it wasn't too far. I actually think I would be nervous to write about writers because I actually don't know that many writers in close confidence, right? Like if you get a bunch of writers together, sometimes it can get a little scary. Um, <laughs> I don't have, you know, I would actually be more nervous to write about a writer character because I wouldn't know how to represent them. I, I just so prudent of trying to do a good job with it. But with the doctor, I think I just have this, I just know this character so well that um, it did, it wasn't actually that hard to kind of create her. I always knew I was going to write a character like this after chemistry. Well, could you uh, read us an excerpt? Yeah. Um, so this is from the middle of the novel. This is when um, everything from this part on, I really had to drastically re-tinker with because none of this was in the draft. I turned it in March, and I had to figure out a way to introduce um, COVID into the novel. And I was like, well, I'm, just, I'm not going to do it in a subtle way. I might as well just you know, introduce it. So this is coming from that middle section of when... COVID would have kind of started. At the end of December, some people in China, in the city of Wuhan, had contracted pneumonia, a cluster of cases stemming from a visit to a fish market earlier that month. Cases continued throughout January, and details about them were scarce, 
except that it turned out not to be pneumonia and to be a new kind of disease from an unknown virus, possibly derived from bats that were likely that were being sold illegally at the market. I didn't know whether I should be paying attention or not. I'd never been to Wuhan and was no virologist. My mother hadn't texted me about it, nor my brother. The local news touched on it briefly and went straight into weather and traffic delays. The international news spent a minute longer on China and then moved to the turmoil in the Middle East. But viruses have always fascinated me, and I couldn't look at a New York skyline without thinking of them. The water towers on many buildings reminded me of bacteriophages, or viruses that infect bacteria, with a capsid-bound head and legs that can attach themselves to the host and force entry. Fascinating to me that viruses could infect living cells and take over, but not be living themselves only carriers of genetic code, only genes bound by membrane. Not being alive means that viruses are ungovernable by evolutionary laws like survival of the fittest or reproductive strain. So without this basic constraint and purpose, how have they persisted through millennia, invading cell after cell? Plagues, the outcomes are always bad for animals, for humans, but viruses themselves are neither good nor bad. They have no moral compass or desire to live. And so the only reason I had for their existence was random chance. On January 23rd, Wuhan was sealed off in the strictest meaning of the term. No one enters and no one leaves. Days before the lockdown took effect, 5 million people left the city without being screened. The crowds at the train station were astounding, buying tickets to go anywhere as long as the place wasn't Wuhan. On January 24th, Chinese New Year started, a one-month holiday and the largest annual human migration in the world, with on average 400 million people traveling, 3 billion trips being made, thousands of train tickets sold per second, and selling out within a minute of being posted. The migration was usually from urban to rural. Some 250 million migrant workers left the cities to see their families back home. At some point, these numbers just became numbers to me. I couldn't comprehend the size of China anymore, not what gro nor what growing up there would have been like. I called my mother, but it went straight to voicemail. I called my brother, but he didn't pick up. I texted Tammy, what's going on? Tammy replied right away that nothing was going on. Everyone was just busy skiing and having fun. Your mother forgets to charge her phone sometimes, or she accidentally turns it off. I asked Tammy what she thought about the news, since all of her family was still in Chongqing, and wasn't that kind of close to Wuhan? She replied that I clearly wasn't familiar with China's geography, and why would I be? But Chongqing was like a one hour drive from Wuhan, or a six-hour bullet train, almost 500 miles apart, and in completely different provinces. But should there be any trouble, her family would follow government guidelines exactly and be fine. On January 25th, which was New Year's Day, officially the year of the rat, the lockdown expanded to other cities in Hubei province, confining 59 million people to their homes or a larger population than New York City, London, Paris, and Moscow combined. No formal antonym for catastrophizing exists, but why did it seem that more people had this trait than not? Isn't it more evolutionarily favorable to catastrophize? Does future does fortune truly favor the bold? That was great. Thank you. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say how much I loved your novel. It was just, the character of Joan is just so um, so funny and smart and just so original in the way that she moves through the world. Um, and I just found it so interesting that you turned in a draft that didn't have COVID because it seems like COVID is a really big part of um, yeah. The end and sort of it affirms her sense of self. And I'm just curious, I mean, how did you um what did you have before <laughs> before well, COVID? Before, you know, I've gotten a lot of feedback for the book. No no writer wants feedback after they publish the book. <laughs> Sometimes I get feedback from, you know, readers find my email or something. Um and I get sort of mixed feedbacks about the, the ending. Some people really love it and I love it, right? But some people are like, wait, what you know, I wanted more, I wanted like kind of, you know, Grey's Anatomy, I wanted more stuff happening afterwards. Um, and originally she had just come back into the city um, by, you know, she just couldn't, 
couldn't handle living with her brother and Tammy anymore. And then she comes back into the scene. It actually didn't feel as organic as it does now. But again, like at that time, I really did not want to write COVID into anything. I was just really, I really did not want to. It just felt like there was a contamination that I obviously did not want to put into the writing. Um, and so I really kind of pushed against that. And so that really was the only way I could get her back in, you know, a sense away and there runs a risk of readers saying well i don't really want to read COVID. i wish there wasn't in this book and you know i even though it works for the plot i don't want it in there so that was kind of both the feedback of my editor and sort of like in the end it, it was inevitable and i like how i put it in there but i still think literature is still figuring out how to incorporate things like COVID into books you know um without doing it in kind of like a sci-fi way that um that you know, but in a more kind of like realistic way of how the pandemic has really affected everyone's lives yeah Absolutely. i think it's something that we all um i think it's something we all wrestle with i, I know as an editor we had a big thing about when after 9 11 could you use 9 11 as a plot point if it wasn't about that and i remember turning stories down that it didn't feel it was too soon. It didn't feel right. I guess the same after the Holocaust and other you know, great tragedies in our lives. Maybe there needs to be a certain period of time for it to really kind of percolate out from the immediacy that we can actually process and then apply the creativity to see where, where we go with it. Um, Philip, um, I would love to hear, we would love to hear some poems from your new book, Mutiny. Could you read some for us? Yes. So the first poem I'll read is Final Poem for the Moon. And the second poem I'll read is Final Poem for My Father Misnamed in My Mouth. Uh, both of these poems take on the, the word final as a uh, part of their title, which is a motif in the book, the, uh, the final poem. There are ways to, in some, in some ways they're odes, in many ways they're goodbyes to commonly used tropes. Um, and trying to reimagine how to just have different connections to uh, the moon, the sun, the trees, things that we take for granted. And they're, they're, they're usually infused in our poems. And sometimes um, in my own work, I would find myself not being able to bring new life to them. And so I wanted to write these kind of final poems as reset buttons for, for those moments, for those images. Final poem for the moon. My first lover, my clavicles chiseler sculpting me into blue lamentation and crucible for your lunacy. Summon me to scuttle forward, cancer moon, cancer rising, and feel myself on your dust flashed milk, your gray honey, black green grasses used to sharpen their night blades. My paramour who gowns me in a yawning glint, Helios's canvas by which you find your aspects, Find your shape misshapen in seven eighths, your eighth self finally filled with ochre blood or the ruddy salutations of familiar fever. You pass your sickness to me like fervor. My heart a moon learning all its phases at once. My idiolect and diaphragm, deliberate disc slipped from tough spine. Elysium I pitched my body beneath. White morning glories opening from my sweat flushed back. I feel my veins hop pluck toward you. I rise like any body of water compelled into risk, pulled up the god ladder of your gibbous. You perfect your appetite in my blood. Hematite of harvest, scolocyte that pulls my blood waves to zenith in your skull of good omen. Your lambent weight, witness to worship and worry. I a sun celibate celebrate ensconced in pearl. My mood unravels in your fingerless hand. I dance loot backed in the armory of your nivious eye. Your snake fang posture I hang from my ear. Your crescent weaning me off your nectar. I will grieve your circumference, your diameter, your secant and cord as you renew yourself with erasure. Moon as a mouth no more. Moon as a wound no more. Moon wound round my fists no more. Moon in the grips of hunger. Moon chip-toothed, goat eye round and shock no more. 
Moon, no beast aspires to kiss. Moon, the color of my coming, no more. Misery, moon. Moon, dipped in a whale. Moon, sick, no more. Moonward, dust floats but lingers, no more. Moon, heavy chimney, no more. Moon, washed tongue, washing me, no more. Full moon, night chandelier, no more. How high the no more moon. The cow jumps over the never moon. Moon river, no more. Wider than a mile, my arms take the shape of you, no more. Do not watch me while I look for you in the galaxy that breathes your many names. Sukuyomi, Koyoshaki, Shange, Kansu. I am malaised by moon glut, moonstruck, Lunatic eclipsed by my lips, supplicant. Oh. Wow. Amazing. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, and then final poem for my father misnamed in my mouth. Sunlight still holds you and gives your shapelessness to every room. By noon, the kitchen catches your hands, misshapen sun rays. The windows have your eyes taken from me, your body. I reorder my life with absence. You are everywhere now, where once I could not find you, even in your own body. Death means everything has become possible. I've been told I have your ways. Your laughter haunts my mother from my throat. Everything is possible. Father light washes over the kitchen floor. I try to hold a bit of kindness for the dead and make of memory a sponge to wash your corpse. Your name is not addict or sir. This is not a dream. You died and were buried three times. Once after my birth, again against your hellos shedding into closing doors. Your face a mask I placed over my face, the final time, you beneath my feet. Was I buried with you then? I will not call what you had left anything other than gone or sweet, perhaps. I am not your junior, but I fell in love with being your son. Now what? Possibility was a bird I once knew. It had one wing. Wow. Thank you so much. That was incredible. And I just love how um, the poems are, they're both final poems, but they're just so different in tone and energy. And you have the playfulness of the poem with the moon, where you're kind of questioning all these poetic tropes. And then you go into this very complicated kind of grief um, in the second. And I just wonder if we could talk a little bit more about the final poem for my father, misnamed in my mouth. Um, I just love the complexity of that and the way that um, the sun um, tries to make of memory a sponge to wash your corpse. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wonder if we can talk about the ways that we memorialize the dead. And I'm thinking of another poem of yours um, in your collection, January 28th, 1918. And mm -hmm. there's a line there where you say, um, to poeticize could be and often is interpreted as to make beautiful. What is the border between tragedy and beauty? I feel like that's just so resonant um, when we're talking about COVID. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit more about this, this uneasy relationship between beauty and tragedy. Yeah, thank you, Doris. Um, that's a hard question because I, I often consider myself to be an elegist. I think the majority of my poems are in some ways considering what does it mean to to be alive when so many around you are dying or have already dead. And if death is a natural process, then what do we make of grief when we refuse to grieve, are not given the opportunity to grieve? I think with COVID, um, there's no, there hasn't been an opportunity to even sit with the self before we know that grief is necessary. Um, it's hard to find the moments of, uh, and speaking for myself, what what do I need? <laughs> what do I need in this moment to continue? What do I need to feel safe to go back to um, Osmondson's piece? What do I need to feel 
if not safe, at least seen. Um, I think COVID has made a, uh, revealed that the invisibility of a lot of people was societal. Um, a mm -hmm. lot of the ways in which we are ignored is was quite on purpose. Um, a lot of the resources that we received or or didn't receive was based on arbitrary geographical lines. And it's it's hard to grieve in moments where you are not even given access to your humanity, right? And so I think first and foremost, what I wanted to do was find the the the, the linchpin between not just uh, the grief and the living, but uh, having a life that people believe is was was important, or having lives that that are important enough to to remember. And with my father, I didn't want to always remember him as the father who was never there because of drugs. I wanted to remember him as someone who had a complicated life, and that in his absence, in many ways, it protected me. Oh, um, and all of this is to say that I, I only hope that in in some capacity we will have the moment to to just pause and reflect on our own selves our shadow selves our our wounded child so that we can finally then get some kind of access to to say goodbye to those who we've lost COVID has rushed the process and and i can't imagine you know having to be in a in a point in life where it's endless endless loss and we don't have time to mentally emotionally and physically uh, handle that with care. Yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. Um, absolutely. And, and I'd like you to continue on this subject of grief. You know, in, in your novel, uh, the character Joan is dealing with the death of her father and she buries mm -hmm. herself uh, in work at the hospital, but HR insists she take leave. Quote, we believe that even the most well-seasoned health professionals should grieve. Those deep in grief often don't know how to feel about the death unless they take the full course of treatment. And Joan wow. replies, I clarify that she was talking about bereavement and not an infection. And the <laughs> HR person says, consider it, the hospital, consider it the hospital's way of reaching its arms out and giving you a hug. Now, there's humor here, but there's also a comment being made about what we expect from the process of grieving. And can you talk a bit about this, kind of what your character's up against and wanting to grieve on her own versus the way um, others or her work is imposing it on her? Right. I mean, like Philip said, there's almost this rush to kind of grieve, get it done with, right? And then, you know, how many times have we heard, let's return back to normal, let's return, you know, return to normalcy or whatever. There's this accelerated idea that um, you have to get it all out of your system and then you can kind of go back to baseline, right? right. And, and do it the right way. There's a and certain way to do right it. Way. You know, there's like steps, there's ways that you can grieve, but there's ways that you can't grieve. Like for her, yeah, the, with, with Joan, I just wanted to play into most doctors that I know are, are pure what call like something. That's how they, that's their, that's their hobby. Um, and so of taking that away, that kind of removal is grief, right? She's grieving the loss of her father, or she's grieving the loss of her work. And kind of like what Philip was saying, what happened in the pandemic is you're just stuck with your own thoughts by yourself with no distraction, you know? And if you're going under some sort of very um, mental and emotionally stressing thing, like the loss of a relative, you are just stuck with those feelings. Um, there is no distraction. And, and I thought, with, you know, HR has, I mean, this is sort of like a fictional HR. This fictional HR has a certain way that they believe grief should be handled because it's kind of like mental health check mark, right? I mean, you know, I don't know how many surveys I filled out about my own mental health check mark. Um, but the sense is like, how can mental health be quantified, right? It's not, it's not a math problem. It's not binary. On a scale of one to 10, I have no idea. I could go from a 10 on one day and then like five hours later be at a one. Um, there's no way to kind of, totally gather that data um and so what hr is thinking i you know data's done i can figure it out on statistical level this is we get over grief but that's the problem with stat stats is that it's a group level assessment and not for the individual and it's kind of a very unique person even though she doesn't she doesn't really think she is and i think everyone grieves in their own very very unique and very private way you know some days they're like i'm over it and then some days they're really back in it again it reminds me of those mandatory wellness modules that 
<laughs> you have to take it in cor- the corporate world and in the medical world so they can check the box that we have. We've given wellness to our employees, and so we're done. But it's so insane. It's just because you can't sue them, right? It's like it's like a legal thing. I don't even think it's a care or anything. Right. Right. Yeah, I, I think that's something that that you touch on also, Philip. And you have this poem, Black Joy, where you, I, I was, um, I was listening to the conversation you had with Dennis Smith about um, about that. And just the idea of like sometimes the world insists on a certain kind of narrative when it comes to talking about the dead, and it it can insist on some kind of like joy, which is false, especially thinking about the kind of violence that's done um, to to black people in this country and. Um, and yeah, I mean, do you think you, you do you agree just that sometimes we just want to put things in a box and um, and just, um, <laughs> you know, check off the checklist and OK, we're done. We're moving on. Oh, absolutely. There's been a conflation between the methods by which we protect each other being, you know, they're conflated with trauma, <laughs> like like, you know, not doing certain things is an imposition as opposed to a way of creating a, a generation of care, right? Or, or a kind of habit of care for others who we know and who we don't know. And it's it's unsettling for some folks to sit in the darkness, to sit in the dark and deal with that as though somehow every time there is something that makes us uncomfortable or is harmful that we are owed by <laughs> the abstraction that is uh, that is joy, like joy is, it belongs to us in that way. But all of these emotions are really important. And it's all, I mean, if I can be as, as blunt as possible, it's all capitalism. It's like, how can we get you to feel a particular way so that all of our lives can be made easier? You can get back into the, the workforce. You can get back to putting the clothes on the shelves, making the burgers, getting the movies done that we want to watch, um, and giving me back my comfort. As you know, and and sitting in the dark is a huge part of our experiences. And I can understand when you're, uh, uh, particularly if you're part of a community that is always the at the the brunt of, uh, at the receiving end of of some kind of uh, uh, weapon or some kind of harm, that you just want a moment of respite, a moment of peace, a moment to feel fully human, which is to feel the full expanse of whatever our emotional capabilities are. And that includes joy. We don't all, we also don't want trauma porn, but I'm interested in the balance between, you know, w- wanting to say, I am a person who can feel um, joy, but then also I need to know that when I feel pain, that there's a processing that needs to happen so that when I return to joy, I can better understand it and I can evolve from that and not feel as though there's treacher- there's always a kind of precarity <laughs> of losing oneself. And so that's so black joy is a, really a response not to this idea that black people can feel joy. Who needs to be reminded of that and why are we reminding them of that? It's is more so like how do we not allow for there to be these parameters that say you need to stop feeling sadness. You need to stop feeling anger, which is mutiny is a big part of just allowing myself to feel angry. I was never allowed to do that. Yeah. Never allowed to do that. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm, I'm going on for a bit, but I just, it's the complexity cannot be in response to excess uh, darkness that we have excess light. It has to be, how do we modulate between the two and how do we allow both to coexist? Right, and when you talk about um, sitting in the dark with emotions, it's it's a nice um, touch point for me to introduce Sarah Rule, someone who spends a lot of time processing emotions in in the dark. Sarah Rule is a prolific, award-winning playwright. Just a few of her dozens of plays are The Vibrator Play and The Clean House, both Pulitzer nominees, Passion Play, which was a Penn American winner, and Eurydice, which became the libretto for an opera at the Met. She's also the author of a best-selling memoir, Smile, the Story of a Face, about her experience with a severe case of Bell's palsy, which left her with a lopsided smile. She also, it turns out, a poet and has a new book coming out uh, called Love Poems in Quarantine. And I recently caught up with Sarah Rule. So um, it's so wonderful to mention this beautiful book, Love Poems in Quarantine. And uh, Sarah, I wonder if you could tell us a bit about writing this, writing this book? Sure. Um, 
I began writing it, I suppose, when the kids were on Zoom school all day long, um, when, the, when the school shut down. And I thought, what, what could I do with my son when he's bored? And I thought, well, I could write poetry with him. And so we wrote a haiku together. And then I decided to write a haiku every day to mark uh, the seasons changing, to mark the days mm -hmm. passing. And also the theater was completely shuttered. So I started to mark nature in a different way. And it was really a way of holding my mind steady, you know, during a difficult year. Yeah. Could you read the very first poem? Sure. Um, I feel like I did a lot of laundry in quarantine. I'm sure everybody did. Um, I don't know why it suddenly seemed like there was more laundry. Um, and this is called, What Are We Folding When We Are Folding Laundry in Quarantine? Standing four feet apart, you take one edge of the sheet, I take the other. We walk toward one another, creating order, like solemn campers folding a flag in the early morning light. But this is no flag. This is where we love and sleep. There was a time we forgot to do this, to fold with and toward one another, to make the edges clean together. My grandmother might have said, there's always more laundry to do, and that is a blessing because it means you did more living, which means you get to do more cleaning. We forgot for a while that one large blanket is too difficult for one shin to hold and two hands to fold alone, that there is more beauty in the walking toward the fold and in the shared labor. Wow. Yeah, no, and I think that one of the interesting things about quarantine is that we go through different like life phases in this very isolated way. And I wonder if, if you want to talk about that or maybe share one of your poems. Yeah, well, like it was, as soon as the the quarantine hit, it, my body was like, okay, well, I'm just going to be in menopause now. And it was like, we're going to pause all your activities and we're just going to take a giant pause. Um, so this one is called Menopause and Quarantine. Oh, second maidenhood, at 46, my breasts are smaller. For three months, no blood between my legs, a new virginity. My brain will be pregnant, not my body, for the rest of this lifetime, at least. Your birthday is coming, and I must select a gift. You tend to like things that are pretty because they are useful. And so I buy you four mugs and one knife holder. We are almost out of mugs, and there is no place to put the knives. And I was correct. You loved your gifts. Finally, a gift that is useful, you said. The mugs are open for pouring. The knives are ready to be sheathed. Oh, second maidenhood, second virginity. Is beauty use and use beauty. Wow. Um, can you talk about COVID and the creative process? Was there a relationship in one way or the other or not at all? I found it in some ways, a liberating and deeply creative time. I mean, it, it was scary. I felt untethered. I'd spent so much of my life after the age of, of 25 in the theater where, you know, you're working on a kind of um, a rhythm of production, then writing, then production. So being alone, then being with others. And suddenly I was thrown into such deep solitude. Um, and it felt very strange to write for the theater during that time because I couldn't be in a room with actors to hear it out loud, even though there was Zoom and we all tried to do things, but it wasn't the same. So I guess I found it liberating to be thrown back into a beginner's mind and into into poetry again, which was always my first love. So it felt like a, a return to that. And I guess because theater was so much my culture and I couldn't have it, I thought, well, nature is is my culture now and I can have it and it's it's fairly uninhabited. And so I, I wrote about it. Right, it's interesting because, you know, theater really requires an audience. It's really, yeah. you know, reading a play is not as much fun as seeing the play, um, but poetry is very interior and maybe it's no surprise that poetry really flourished during, during the quarantine. It's so true. There's there's nothing cozy to me about curling up with a play, even though I read plays all the time. But it's so cozy to curl up with um with a book of poetry. It's comforting in a different way. And I do think you're right. The audience is this essential last ingredient for a play to really breathe. Did you ever worry that you'd never have an audience again? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I did. I mean, we we didn't know what would happen. At first we thought, oh, my play's postponed for a month. And then it was 
three months and then it was two years. Um, so I'm having a play that was supposed to be in the pandemic. We'll be at Lincoln Center in the fall. So, you know, two and a half years later. But the theater is really still um, struggling. So it, it, it is beautiful to see people back there, though. I mean, in some ways, the theater feels like an, an antidote because it's really the exact opposite. Yes. Of, of distancing, of quarantining. Yes. It, is, it is community. It has to be community. It has to be present, alive. You've got to get dressed. You've got to get out the door. You've got to change out of your sweatpants. I mean, you're not required to. <laughs> well, I think it's a lot like music. I think the first live music performance I went to after the acute phase of the pandemic was was liberating. I'd forgotten that it's not the same as just listening to music. There's something very much uh, uh, alive. Um, I wonder if you would close by reading the poem, Wikipog. Yeah. And I, I spent some time in Rhode Island during the um, pandemic where my husband and I met and went to college and we spent some time in a little town called Wikipog. And um, um, I mean, the poem's pretty self-explanatory, but I wrote it after George Floyd was murdered and after there was that horrible incident in, in Central Park. Um, in New York um, with a woman who called the cops um, on the man who was watching birds. Uh, so it's called Weekapog. You walk down the street, mostly white houses, mostly white folks and gray granite. You are not white and you walk here every day. And the Central Park dog lady, who I outwardly resemble, hovers between us, a golem. Inside my wave, simple friendliness, or do I want absolution from my murderous race? Inside your wave, simple friendliness, or the hope that I do not enlist the state to kill you? We walk on, every day we pass each other, every day we have the chance to love. Wow. Was that a hard poem to write? Uh, yeah, I mean, it was a hard time for everyone in this country just to be reckoning with everything we were reckoning with it was a, it was a hard time to look at others and to look at the self and i think that you know part of writing this book was that was interesting for me was to see how my concerns changed before george floyd was murdered and after um you know and thinking about how white poets have sort of the luxury in a way of writing about laundry or flowers or, or what have you um and not writing about whiteness not not writing about race um and I found that that my concerns had shifted pretty radically. Right. And do you think poetry in some ways is an easier way to angle into this you know, complex topic than, for example, writing a nonfiction first person essay? I guess poetry gives you a little space and a little bit of breath and a little bit of tenderness, maybe. Um, and maybe we need a little bit of breath and space and tenderness around some of these issues. Um, and I think with theater, one thing that's amazing um, is that you have so many bodies within one place. You have so many bodies to tell a story and, and poetry is, you know, in a way more about breath than it is about the body. Um, so in that way, I don't know how to say it. I mean, I think I think there's been so much discussion about who can inhabit other bodies, uh, you know, in fiction, in the imagination. Mm -hmm. um, and in that poem anyway, I was just really inhabiting my own first person body and talking about what was inside a simple wave with a neighbor. Um, and I think, you know, it's something people think about, but often goes goes unsaid. And I do think poetry is good at, at, at making the unsaid said. That's beautiful. Thank you. Um, the book is Love, Poems, and Quarantine by Sarah Rule. And Sarah, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. It was a delight. Thanks for having me. I wanted to come back to something Sarah Rule was talking about. Um, and she was saying that um, the murder of George Floyd changed her writing practice and that it was a hard time to look at others in the self. And just this idea of looking um, in our writing and I guess connecting it to something that you brought up earlier, Philip, and, um, that yeah, just write the anger, the fe that feeling that I think was so um, so many of us felt during the pandemic. And, and Waikiki, that also I think um, is a part of your character. There's this great line in there, where something <laughs> I don't remember exactly how it goes, but uh, you know, the female brain, and she had R A G E, 
imprinted on her brain. Just the sort of, you know, um, I guess the question is really just um, what it, how does our writing um, become a way of looking at others in the self? And um, and there's a line in uh, another one of your poems, Philip, where um, you say, where to see means to imagine, to write truth or write torture with generosity or with a torch lit under history's feet. Mm -hmm. And just wondered if we can talk a little bit about the project and place of writing at this moment in history. Um, and Waiki, do you wanna, um, do you wanna say something about that? First? Um. Sure, yeah, of course. Um, I think one thing that Philip said of, um, is very just is very true. You, you're not allowed to be angry because if you're angry, it plays into certain stereotypes that maybe you really don't want to enforce and you want to be known as a full human being with a range of emotions that's not just quiet or angry, like a light switch, you know? Um, I think with the topic of race in America is always very hard. Um, I think the Asian population, I'm not speaking for all Asians, I'm just thinking about this community as a whole. Sometimes we try to ignore that that is an actual matter um, and we sort of just kind of brush it under the rug. We just try to ignore it. We're not you know, angry about anything. We just wanna like get by. Um, and that I think is one of the reasons I wanna write. Um, is that you're kind of expressing something that is almost taboo. Um, like there's so many topics that I can't talk to people about, like mental health, um, race, um, anything that you know, you're know happy about because you should just be grateful you're in this country and blah, 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 right? Like, so I'm so grateful for being grateful that um, sometimes it just makes you really annoyed and frustrated, but you can't show it because then people will tell you how grateful you should be. <laughs> Which is so toxic. Yeah. Oh. And, 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 it just and, so happy, you know? <laughs> but, but how? It's, without conversation, without dialogue, it's the assumption that everything goes away once you hit the switch that doesn't even actually exist, Wacky. I just, I'm with you. Yeah. I just love that line about um, a torch lit under history's feet. I mean, it's sort of like, how are we going to remember this time um, yes. later? How are we going to write about this time? You know, when we look back on it um, in retrospect, um, are we going to put a torch under history's feet, or are we going to just, you know, talk about how grateful we were, <laughs> how much, how happy we were that, you know, um, for whatever? I mean, I think that's um, that'll be really interesting to see. Do you believe that the people who, um, you know, say that they push that agenda of, you know, you should be grateful? Do you, do you believe that they're actually sitting in their own gratitude? I don't. I, I don't I think don't, so. I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't. It's interesting. It's interesting. Just there's certain words that I've just, I just heard like hundreds and thousands of times that I think when I hear it again, I'm, it's like not original. It's not surprising. I think it's something that we've thought about a lot, you know? Um, it's, it's about kind of like, I guess, ownership and um, just sort of, you know, how you live your life should be something that is determined by by you, I think. Mm -hmm. um, it's very similar to the idea that you should grieve only in a certain way and certain things require you to be grateful, damn it. And, you know, it's, it's really kind of this uh, onus that you, thou shalt be grateful for all these things. And if you don't feel grateful in that particular moment, then you're not living up to your humanly duties. I'd like to, as we're getting toward our close, is sort of think about going forward. I mean, right now, the pandemic, there's really no end in sight. You know, it is for the time being going on. We've got monkeypox for the next pandemic. Um, thinking about it, may ha in thinking about how it may or may not shifted your creative process, how do you see kind of what you're doing now, what's going forward, and has the pandemic affected that and what your choice of writing or how you're writing it? Um, Waiki, maybe you can take this first. Um, the pandemic is always part of my life at this point. Um, most of my, my family, except for my parents, are in China. I don't know when I'm going to see them again. I probably will never see my grandmother again because of the strict border control. So I think it's to ignore it and just, I'm just, it's just always going to be part of my work. Um, and I also, you know, I'm married into a family who are very anti-science and anti-whatever. So it's just a very, very present topic on my mind. Um, and I care a lot about science. So um, 
I, I don't think the pandemic's ever going to go away. I, I have trouble ignoring that. I think it's going to be just the setting, but maybe it'd be, it would be like, you know, before the pandemic, this character believed this, after the pandemic or during it, you know, um, vaccination, things like that. I think every word I'm going to have to think a little bit more about the multi-layers that that's going to have. Um, Philip, how about you going forward? How will the pandemic play a role, if any, in your creative process? I have to see. I don't know. Every day has been so different. There are some days where I am completely ready to to work and, and go forth. And then there are other days where I am actually disallowed a kind of process that I need, which is to get out and just float around because um, a, a shutdown may, may happen. So I don't really know from day to day, week to week, uh, how the virus um, and our response or lack of response to it will affect, you know, what I write. But as far as it's, it, it, to answer the question differently, will the will it make its way in my work directly? I don't think so. I don't think so. I'm saying that now, like, <laughs> I have a predictor of what my creativity wants, but I'm, I'm more so interested in thinking about um, just my interiority in ways that I, I, I didn't even know I could do because I was so distracted by uh, all of the ways that I was coping, you know? Um, now I want to really uh, write more poems about um, uh, loneliness and depression and and having a body and loving the body and healing the body, things like that, without really mentioning, you know, COVID at all. And to be honest with you, and this might be actually a wrong head, it's, really, it's just a, an opinion. I feel like prose gives more space for that. So maybe if I write a prose piece, it could come in eventually. But with poetry, um, I, I, I look at the world a bit more interiorly when I when I do the, 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 the poems, but particularly these days. So I'm not sure. Thank you, Philip and Waikiki, for joining us today. Um, just want to remind everyone, Philip B. Williams' most recent collection of poetry is Mutiny, which was named one of the best books of 2021 by the Boston Globe and Lit Hub. <laughs> Yay. And Waikiki Wang's latest novel is Joan is OK, which came out this year and has been getting rave reviews. And it is a New York Times editor's choice. And special thanks to Joe Osmondson and Sarah Rule for joining us. Joseph Osmondson is a biologist at NYU. His newest book is Virology, Essays for the Living, the Dead, and the Small Things in Between. And Sarah Rule is a playwright, author, and poet. Her newest book is Love Poems in Quarantine. Thank you to the Brooklyn Book Festival for co-sponsoring this event with Bellevue Literary Review. Literary journals are where the creative process takes root. So be part of this exciting process and visit blreview.org and get a subscription for yourself or a lucky friend. Thank you to our audience for joining us today. We'll see you at the next event. Bye.